hello guys welcome to my channel so today we will study about the small molecules in the cells um, as we studied how the atoms are combined water atoms how the atoms form the molecules and everything so now we'll see how the atoms combine to form small molecules that are important for the cells all right and uh, if we see a cell if we think about a cell so on a molecular level like when we think so like what the cell is formed formed from so a cell is formed from carbon compound all right here formed from carbon compounds we know there is the much of the quantity is the water but if we disregard the water then almost all the molecules in the cell are based on carbon why carbon because carbon is an outstanding among all the elements in its ability to form large molecules like the silicon that has the same number of electron and the same vacancies as the carbon but it's poorly second because as we know carbon is a small atom and has four electrons and has four vacancies so carbon has four electrons and has four vacancies in outer shell so because of this four vacancy it can form four covalent bonds with other atoms and especially it can also form a bond with carbon the carbon to carbon covalent bond is highly stable and that can form chains and rings and hence generate large and complex molecules with no obvious upper limit to their size so the small and large carbon compounds made by cell are called organic molecules so when we think about the organic molecules in the cells so what are the organic molecules the small and large carbon compounds made by cells are called organic molecules there are certain combination of atoms as well that we'll see more often in the cell so such as methyl group hydroxyl carboxyl carbonyl phosphoryl and amino now i will write it down All right so methyl group all right, so this methyl group we'll see often then hydroxyl hydroxyl group we'll see then carboxyl we'll see carboxyl then carbonyl carbonyl then phosphoryl So this is phosphoryl, sorry. So it has three here, phosphoryl and also amino group. All right, so this is amino group and all this group will see repeatedly in the organic molecules. Right, and each such chemical group has distinct chemical and physical properties. So this all has different chemical and physical properties so that influences the behavior of the molecule in which the group is attached all right so this was just a basic that the cell is most so if we have the knowledge of knowing this group and their chemical properties that greatly simplifies understanding the chemistry of life if you are learning about the chemistry of life all right so moving further so the cell contains four major families of small organic molecule we see like the cell has organic molecules but what kind of organic molecules so there are different kinds though but there are there is most four major families of small organic molecule right down so contains 
Paulo. Organic molecule. All right, so we'll study all the force. There's four major families in details. So the small organic molecules of the cell are carbon compounds. And with the molecular weights that range from 100 to 1000 that contains up to 30 or so carbon atoms in each of their chains, like there should be like at least 30 or, or more than 30 carbon atoms. And where these are found, where this organic molecules are found, so they are found free in the cytosol um, in the solution and have many different roles. So this organic molecules have many different, different roles. It's not just like all the organic molecules is defined to just one role. So for example, some are used as a monomer subunits to construct the cell giants polymeric macromolecules like protein, nucleic, acids and large polysaccharides. Uh, on the other hand, other serves as an energy sources and can be break down and transformed into another small molecules in a maze of intracellular metabolic pathways. Um, we'll learn more about the uh, metabolic pathways as well in the biochemistry. Uh, many have more than one role in the cell acting, for example, as a potential subunit of for a macromolecule and it also serves as an energy source as well so the acting you heard about that serves as a potential subunit of a macromolecule and also as an energy source so it is not just that all the organic molecules are defined to just one role it can have multiple roles as well so the small organic molecules are much less abundant than the organic molecule macromolecules accounting for only about one tenth of the total mass of organic matter in a cell all organic molecules are synthesized from and are broken down into the same sets of chemic simple compounds so how these organic molecules are formed so all organic molecules are synthesized from and also are broken down into the same set of simple compounds so both their synthesis and a breakdown occur through the sequence of simple chemical changes that are limited in a variety and follow step by step rules. So it always follow the step by step rules for the formation or for the breakdown of this organic molecules. So as a, cons as a consequence, the compounds in a cell are chemically related and most can be classified into a small number of distinct families like broadly speaking, cells contain four major families of small organic molecules. So that is, so which four? The first is sugar. So first is the sugar. Second is fatty acids. Right? Write it down. Third is Amino acids and the uh, fourth one is nucleotides. All right, so these are the four major families of organic molecules in the cell. So we'll study all this in detail sugar, fatty acids, amino acids, and nucleotides. All right, so now we'll study about the sugars. The first organic molecule all right so when we think about this sugar so sugars are both energy sources and subunits of polysaccharides so sugar serves as an energy source and subunit of polysaccharide right so the simplest sugar the monosaccharide the simplest sugar the monosaccharide are compound with the general formula like if we see the general formula for monosaccharide so if we see monosaccharide so the simplest sugar that is a monosaccharide and what's the general formula for it so 
that is CH2O and then N, where N can be 3, 4, 5, or 6. So it depends on which sugar it is. All right, so that is the general formula for the monosaccharide. So sugars, so sugars and the larger molecules made from them are also called carbohydrates. So when we hear about carbohydrates in in future, when we are studying any system or anything, and so what are carbohydrates? So the sugars and larger molecules made from them are called carbohydrates. Sugars and molecule made from them. called carbohydrates so let's see an example of glucose so glucose so that has a formula c6 h12 o6 right so, all right so let's see an example of glucose so glucose and the sim uh, the formula is C6, H12, O6. So if we put 6 here, so C6, 6 to the 12, and O6. So the formula, however, does not define uh, the molecule. So the same set of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The same set of that is 6 carbon, 12 hydrogen, and 6 oxygen can be joined in different ways to form a different sugar. Right, for example, the, the glucose can be converted into galactose or mannose. Can be converted into galactose or mannose, and both have this same chemical formula. That's just simply by switching the orientation of specific hydroxyl group in the sugar. And each of these sugars, moreover, can exist in either of two forms. That is called a D form and the L form, which are the mirror image of each other. So set of the molecules with the same chemical formula, but different structures are called isomers. So set of molecules that has the same chemical formula, but this both has different structures so that are called isomers and the mirror images pairs of such molecules are called optical isomers so now monosaccharide so if you monosaccharide that's a single a simple sugar monosaccharide can be linked by a covalent bond and when two monosaccharides are joining by the covalent bond the bond is called glycosidic bond so like for example monosaccharide that is like uh, glucose Glucose plus glucose. So this joined by covalent bond, and this bond is called glycosidic bond. So monosaccharide can be linked by covalent bond, and that bond is called glycosidic bond to form larger carbohydrates. So two monosaccharides linked together, if two monosaccharides linked together are called it's called disaccharide. Disaccharide. So chestocrose, which is composed of galactose, glucose, and a fructose unit. Larger sugar polymers from oligosaccharides. So oligosaccharide can be like trisaccharide, tetrasaccharide, and so on, up to a giant polysaccharides, which can contain thousands of monosaccharides, subunits. So in most cases, the prefix oligosaccharides, when you here the term oligosaccharide it is typically used to refer just 2 to 10 in the case of oligosaccharide that's it if it's more than 10 it's definitely called polysaccharide so the, and the way the sugars are linked together illustrates some common features of biochemical bond formation so uh, i will post a picture you will see a picture here on the screen so bond is formed between an hydroxyl group that you can see 
of one sugar and hydroxyl group of another by condensation reaction. What is condensation reaction? In which a molecule of water is expelled as a bond is formed. So when the hydroxyl group are joined, a water is expelled and that reaction is called condensation reaction. The subunit in other biological polymers including nucleic acid and proteins are also linked by condensation reaction. So not only the sugar but nucleic acid and proteins are also linked by condensation reaction in which water is expelled. So the bonds created by all of this condensation reaction can be broken by the reverse process that is called hydrolysis. So when you add water in it, the bond can be broken and that process is called hydrolysis. Right? Condensation reaction and hydrolysis and the condensation reaction is used in the linking of sugars, even nucleic acid and proteins. And because each monosaccharide has several free hydroxyl group, so every monosaccharide that I that you can see in the picture has free hydroxyl group at one end, groups that can form a link to another mole, another monosaccharide. So it can just attach to sugars and can be like thousands of polysaccharides, thousands of monosaccharides joining, making polysaccharide. And the number of possible polysaccharide structure is extremely large. So for this reason, it is much more difficult to determine the arrangement of sugars in a complex polysaccharide than to determine the nucleotide sequence of a DNA molecule or the amino acid sequence of a protein in which each unit is joined to the next in exactly the same way. Right, so... Uh, and the monosaccharide glucose has a central role as an energy source for the cell. So the cell, what is the central role of monosaccharide? <clears throat> that serves as an energy source and this is the central role of monosaccharide. So it is broken down to smaller molecules in a series of reactions releasing energy that the cell can harness to do useful works. So cell uses simple polysaccharides composed only of glucose unit, principally glycogen in animals and starch in plants as long-term stores of glucose held in the reserve for energy production. And also smaller oligosaccharide can be can be covalently and linked to proteins as well. So it is not that the sugars is joining with the, only the sugars. So like for example, a smaller oligosaccharide, so that might be like three monosaccharides attached together, can be covalently and linked to a protein to form glycopro, uh, glycoproteins or to the lipids to form glycolipids. So you have uh, monosaccharide, sorry, tetrasaccharide. Put it as a tetra. Saccharides joins with proteins that is called glycoproteins. And if it's joins with lipids, that is called glycolipids. Right? And differences in the types of cell surface. Sugars form the molecular base for different human blood groups that we'll also study in later and when we'll study the system. Right, but this is the basic for the sugars in the cell. Like when we'll study biochemistry, we'll see much more details for the sugars as well. All right, so that was sugars. So now we'll study about fatty acids, the second major family of organic molecule. Fatty acids where the fatty acid are components of cell membrane so where the fatty acids are found these are the components of of cell membrane so fatty acid molecules such as palmitic acid let's take an example of palmitic acid i will not draw the the long chain, just the short chain, short chain to to explain. Right, 
right? And it can, it goes on, right? So this palmitic acid has two ends. So one is with this, that is carboxylic acid. And there is this tail that is called hydrocarbon tail. Why it's called hydrocarbon tail? Because it has hydrogen and carbon that are covalent linked with each other. So both this tail has different feature. So the hydrocarbon tail is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Phobic means water fearing. It cannot be dissolved in water. But the carboxylic acid group is hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. That is water loving. And this, this is ionized. So it can be attached or chemically reactive in water when it is ionized. So almost all the fatty acid molecules in a cell are covalent linked to other, other molecules by the carboxylic acid group. So whenever you think about the fatty acid molecule, you always have to remember that they are covalent linked by the carboxylic acid group that, that is at the other end. Okay, molecules such as fatty acids that possesses both the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic regions are termed as MP, amphipathic, all right? So that has hydrophobic and hydrophilic are termed as amphipathic, right? So the hydrocarbon tail of palmitic acid, so this tail, hydrocarbon tail is saturated. This tail is saturated, the tail is this. That means what, what does it mean by saturated? That means it does not have any double bonds, no double bonds. You can see it has just a single bond between the carbon to carbon, right? Between its carbon atoms and contains the maximum possible number of hydrogen. So like it just uses one to one carbon atoms and whatever that has a free vacancies, it is used by hydrogen atoms. So the hydrocarbon tail of palmitic acid is saturated because it does not have double bonds between its carbon atoms and contains the maximum possible number of hydrogen. So some other fatty acids such as oleic acid when you see have unsaturated tails. It has unsaturated as well. It's not all the fatty acids have saturated tails. Some other fatty acids like example oleic acid. This has unsaturated tails as well. That means it has one or more double bonds along their length. So the, what the double bond do, double bond creates a kink in the hydrocarbon tail, interfering with their ability to pack together and its absence or presence of these double bonds that accounts for difference between the hard and the soft margarine. So when you think why the margarine, if you buy some margins are soft and some are hard. It is because of this saturated and unsaturated. If it's saturated, it is hard. If it's unsaturated, then it is soft. Right? So fatty acid tails are also found in cell membranes. So this fatty acid tails are found in the cell membranes where the tightness of their packing affects the fluidity of the membrane. Right, so the many different fatty acids found in the cell differ only in the length of the hydrocarbon chain and in the number and the position of the carbon to carbon double bonds. So the fatty acid serves as a concentrated food reserves as well in the cell. So it does it just it does not just serve as an uh, as a tighten for the for the tightness of their so the second function for the fatty acids also serves as a concentrated food reserve in a cell. So they can be broken down to produce six times much usable energy as weight for weight as the sugar, that is the glucose. So fatty acids stored in the cytoplasm of many cells in the form of fat droplets composed of triacylglycerol molecules. So when the fatty acids, when you think about the fatty acid as a concentrated of food reserve, so how it is stored in the in the cell. So the fatty acid stored in the cytoplasm of many cell in the form of 
fat droplets. So this is stored as fat droplets in the cytoplasm that is composed of dry glycerol molecule. All right, compounds made of three fatty acids chain covalently joined to a glycerol molecule. As you can see the picture. This is how triacyl glycerol with the three fatty acids chain and a glycerol molecule. So the triacyl glycerols are the animal fat found in the meat, butter, and cream, and the plant oils such as corn oil and olive oil. So when a cell needs an energy, the fatty acids chain can be released from triacyl glycerols and broken down into two carbon into two carbon units. So these two carbon units are identical to those derived from breakdown of glucose and they enter the same energy yielding reaction. So, it, it, so that means that fatty acids, when they broke down into two carbon units, it does not go any other and especially have their another metabolic pathways to to use as an energy, but it enters the same energy reaction as the sugar when it is break down. That is the breakdown of glucose as well. So fatty acids and their derivatives, including triacyl glycerols, are example of lipids. So fatty acids and their derivatives, including including triacylglycerol are example of are example of lipids. All right. So lipids are loosely defined as molecules that are insoluble in water, but soluble in fat and organic solvents such as Men's and why? Because of the hydrocarbon, hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail. So they typically contain long hydrocarbon chains as in fatty acids or multiple linked aromatic rings as in steroids. The most unique function of fatty acid is in the formation of lipid bilayer. Like the energy source, the energy source that is stored as a fat droplets, that is also one of the function, but the most unique function Any function of fatty acids is a lipid formation of a lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. This thin sheet which encloses all the cells and surround their internal organs are composed largely of phospholipids. So the cell membrane that is a thin sheet which encloses the cell and surrounds the internal organs are composed of phospholipids. So when you hear the term phospholipid, phospholipid, like triacylglycerol, most phospholipids are constructed from fatty acids and glycerol. But in this phospholipid, however, the glycerol is joined to two fatty acids chain rather than three as in triacylglycerol, the remaining hydroxyl group on the glycerol is linked to a hydrophilic phosphate group, which in turn is added to a small hydrophilic compound such as choline. All right, so this, you can see the picture here. Uh, that's how it is attached. So when you think about triacylglycerol, it is has three fatty acids chain and attached to a glycerol. But the phospholipid, has two fatty acids chain attached to glycerol and one hydroxyl group attached to hydrophilic phosphate in the remaining OH group. So with that two hydrophobic fatty acid tails and a hydrophilic, the phosphate containing had phospholipid are strongly amphipathic. So this characteristics amph amphipathic composition and shape gives them different physical and chemical properties from triacyl glycerol which are predominantly hydrophobic. So the triacylglycerol is predominantly hydrophobic, but the phospholipid is hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic. And that's why it has different physical and chemical properties. So cell membranes contain different, differing amounts of other lipids, including glycolipids as well. 
So beside phospholipid, it also has glycolipids too, which contains one or more sugars instead of phosphate group. So it's the same. Just when you glycolipids, so it has sugars instead of phosphate. So why this phospholipid form the membrane? Because of their amphipathic nature, phospholipids readily form membrane in water because the one end is hydrophilic, that's why. So these lipids will spread over the surface of water to form a monolayer with that hydrophobic tails facing the air and the hydrophilic head in the contact with the water. So two such molecular layers can readily combine tail to tail in water to form a phospholipid sand, which what is called a lipid bilayer. So we studied sugars and fatty acids now it's time to study the third one. All right, so now we'll study about the amino acids and what are amino acids that are subunits of protein. So amino acids are subunits of protein. And I draw this for an example. So the de one defining property for amino acids, so they all possesses a carboxylic acid group. So all all the amino acids have this carboxylic acid group and also an amino group. So it has a carboxylic acid group, the amino group, both linked together to their alpha carbon atom. So this is the alpha carbon atom and each amino acid also has its side chain attached to its alpha carbon atom. So this is the side chain and the identity of this side chain is what distinguish one amino acids from another so most importantly this separates one amino acids from another so what the amino acids has the carboxylic group amino acid groups both linked to a carbon atom that is alpha carbon atom and then it is also joined a carbon atom has one side chain and that distinguishes between the amino acid right so cells uses amino acids to build protein so why so that's why it's called some units of protein so the cell uses amino acids to build proteins polymers made of amino acids are which are joined head to tail in a long chain that folds into a three-dimensional structure that is unique to each type of protein. Cell so uses amino acids to build proteins and polymers made of amino acids which are joined head to tail in a long chain that folds up in a three-dimensional structure and that three-dimensional structure is unique to each type of protein. So all protein has different three-dimensional structure. So the covalent bond between the two adjacent amino acids in a protein chain is called polypeptide bond. So when the sugars and sugar two mon saccharides are joined by covalent bond, that bond is called glycoside bond. But when two amino acid joined by covalent bond, that bond is called peptide bond <clears throat> the chain of amino acids is known as polypeptide and the chain of amino acids it's known as polypeptide all right so the peptide bonds are formed by condensation reaction that link one amino acids to the next one as we studied in the sugar right sugars are also linked by condensation reaction amino acids are also linked by condensation reaction and what means condensation reaction the water is expelled from the reaction regardless of the specific amino acids from which it is made polypeptide always has an amino group at one end so it always has an amino group at one end and that is called an end terminus because of amino group and a carboxylic group at another end that is called a three terminus so this differences in the two ends gives a polypeptide a different directionality and a structure 
polarity because of this All right so there are 20 types of amino acids commonly found in the proteins each with different side chain attached to the alpha carbon atom so 20 types of amino acids are commonly found in the are found commonly found in the protein and each with a different side chain to the alpha carbon atom the same 20 amino acids are found in all proteins whether they hail from bacteria plants or animals so it does not means that the same protein that is in the bacteria or it is in plant or is it in animal the same protein has all that 20 set of amino acids and how this is 20 set of amino acids is determined is still mysterious surrounding the evolution so like the research are going on and hopefully someday they'll figure it out how this the same set of 20 amino acids is present in all the proteins of bacteria plants animals and like sugars all amino acids except the glycine exist as an optical isomer in the DNA form so both as a mirror mirror image of each other like sugars but only the L form are ever found in proteins although the D amino acids occur as a part of bacterial cell walls and some antibiotics and D serine is used as a signal molecule in so the chemical versatility that the 20 amino acids provide is vitally really important to the functions of protein Five of the 20 amino acids include lysine and glutamic acid have side chains that can form ions in the solution and can therefore carry a charge. So five of, five of the 20 amino acids including that is a glycine as well and a glutamic acid. So all that side chain can form ions in the solution and if they form ion that means they can carry a charge. The others are uncharged. Some amino acids are polar and hydrophilic and some are non-polar and hydrophobic. All right, so we'll see uh, this amino acids more in details in the biochemistry, but this is the basic of the amino acids right now. All right, so that was amino acids and next we'll study the last one, the nucleotides, one of the major family of organic molecules.